Chapter 3 A week later, and Izuku finally managed to talk himself out of the hospital. He still had specialist appointments to go to, very strict instructions on what he was and wasn't allowed to do, and a tracker attached to his ankle. But he was out. Hospitals were never a pleasant place to be. Besides the bad memories, the boredom was killing him. Halfway through the week, his mother surprised Izuku with a new phone. His old one was lost, presumed destroyed, given it couldn't be called or tracked. The gift meant he could officially start getting up to date on current news, which burned some time. He wasn't allowed to contact his friends yet, with the investigation ongoing. Not that he would have anyway. What would he even say? He hated lying, and saying that he's all right, and there was no need to worry, would be one hell of a lie. Izuku most certainly was not all right, and there was most certainly a need to worry. And this was most certainly not the old apartment. The house stood a single story tall, amid an entire street of similar houses. There was a neat little fence with the Midoriya nameplate, edging a neat little garden that led to a neat little porch. Down the side of the building he could see a backyard lined with trees to stop the neighbours from seeing in. Mom escorted him up the short path, fussing over him as if his legs weren't one of the only things fully healed. His arm was still in a sling, and now he was on less painkillers, his insides still twinged when he moved too fast. At least his hair was starting to grow back. Inside the house looked more familiar, his mother's decorating style on show, but still completely foreign. The entryway led to a main room with a kitchen divided from it by an island bench. Another hallway branched off from the far corner, while the left wall had two doors. Grimly, Izuku set about exploring the house. If he wanted to pretend he'd lived here before, he'd need to know where everything was. If he didn't do it first thing, he could make a mistake and out himself. It was already hard enough not using his secondary quirks. Smokescreen liked to happen when he was startled while on medication. Mom trotted along behind him, getting more and more frazzled with each door he opened then closed. Izuku, what on earth are you doing? Here he'd come up with a plausible lie. Izuku still gritted his teeth before he said it, because he knew it would upset her. Checking for intruders. The pained little sound she made caused an ache to bloom in his heart, settling there for the foreseeable future. There was a reason Mom knew so little about his hero work. This was better than learning he wasn't actually her son. With any luck, he'd work out what was going on and how to reverse it without ever needing to confide in anyone. The doors were a laundry and a small bathroom. Down the corridor, he found four more, all of which were bedrooms. It was easy enough to tell which bedroom was his own and which was his mother's. Another one wasn't personalised, so probably a spare. The fourth, however, had to belong to this mysterious Tenko. Bookcases filled to the brim with video games lined one wall. Another held a large TV, with several consoles hooked up to it. The bed wasn't made, and dirty clothes were thrown haphazardly on the floor. Empty snack packets surrounded an overflowing bin. In its current state of disarray, it did not look like a pleasant place to be living in. As Izuku closed the door, he heard his mother sigh sadly. Hopefully now you're home, he'll stop spiralling. Tenko wasn't having a good time of it, with you kidnapped and then in the hospital. I thought when you woke up he'd start to get more energy again, but then the window incident happened. There was still some bite to the words, window incident. Mom wasn't going to let him forget that one any time soon, no matter what state he was in. The sound of keys scraping in the lock, and the front door opening floated in from the main room. Izuku tensed, but Mom didn't seem bothered. Ah, that must be your father. I thought he'd be here to greet us when you got home. Hope nothing came up. He's been busy enough trying to track down who took you. We need some family time. Dad? Izuku couldn't keep the confusion out of his voice. From context clues, he'd worked out that your father wasn't his biological one. At best guess, his mother had remarried a cop or something, since they were apparently helping with the investigation, and that's why they hadn't visited while he was awake. Mom had never used a name, though, 
It was disconcerting that it was one of the things he wasn't able to find out yet. Taking his good arm, Mom towed him back into the main room. All Might was setting two plastic bags on the kitchen counter, wearing a pink apron and a headband to keep his mess of blonde hair out of his face. Sorry, Inko, he said, distracted. When were you going to collect Izuku? I got some of his favourite. The moment he noticed them, the emaciated man stopped what he was doing and closed the distance between them. Before Izuku had even processed that much, All Might dropped to his knees and enfolded him in the most gentle hug he was pretty sure he'd ever experienced. His brain stopped working after that. He wasn't sure for how long. Izuku, I Izuku, Izuku, can you hear me? Izuku swallowed hard and blinked away the dry feeling in his eyes. Some of the cobwebs still remained on his mind, but at least his ears seemed to be working again. There were hands on his shoulders. He followed them up to All Might's gaunt face, full of concern right now. That was a familiar expression, though less grim than usual. Sorry, he said automatically, but then couldn't think of anything to elaborate with. All Might said something in English, though Izuku's slow mind couldn't translate it right then. It sounded relieved. Mom rushed off to get him some water. One of All Might's hands moved to his cheek, then smoothed back through his short fuzz of hair. Izuku, I'm sorry I couldn't be there for you at the hospital. Izuku shook his head and smiled. It felt plastic, even as he tilted his head back to look at All Might's face. There was more colour there than he remembered, less of the pinched sort of weariness that always seemed to drag on his expression in this form. You were trying to make sure I was safe, right? All Might gave him a sceptical look, but it relaxed after a moment. Let's get you over to the couch. I wanted to surprise you by having everything ready, but I must have read your mother's message wrong. One too many concussions, I suppose. Letting himself be led to the couch, Izuku sat stiffly as a blanket was placed over his lap. A glass of water appeared in his hand, and there was an open bag of the pepper chips he liked sitting on the coffee table. DVDs of hero movies he'd enjoyed as a teen were stacked neatly next to the TV, ready to be put on. Mom and All Might sat next to one another on the love seat perpendicular, close enough to be intimate. They struck up some idle conversation, bouncing off one another. Izuku was fairly certain he answered their questions, but couldn't recall what he'd said. He also ate the chips without tasting them. Eventually, Mom put on one of the movies and they all watched it. The occasional murmur between the adults, the only interruption. When the movie ended, he said, I think I'd like to go to bed. Then he was in his bedroom with no recollection of how he'd gotten there. Izuku couldn't sleep, though. His mind was starting to race without All Might in the room. They'd left him alone, no doubt reassured by the tracker that he wouldn't run off again. No bars on his windows, though that would hardly stop him if he wanted to get out. Not even the wall could do that. Absently, he inspected his room, noting the All Might figures still proudly displayed on a ceiling-to-floor glass door shelving unit. Some looked more expensive than he'd been able to collect as a teen. Presents, perhaps? Did All Might have access to freebies from his own merchandise? The closet he glossed over, as well as the bookcase with actual books this time. Notebooks lined the top two shelves. His desk was neat, which made sense if he'd gone to stay in the dorms at UA. Did they still exist, though, without all the disasters that had made them a necessity? Then there was the corkboard of photos. It was massive and haphazard. Izuku's eyes slid over each picture. He and his mother, Mom and All Might, Mom and All Might in what looked like wedding clothes, Izuku training, Izuku and his friends, Izuku and his family, and... and Shigaraki. Shigaraki with an awkward arm slung over Izuku's shoulder, All Might and Shigaraki pointing at Izuku removing trash from the beach. Shigaraki in what looked like graduation robes between Mom and All Might. Shigaraki giving a much younger Izuku a reluctant piggyback ride. Was Shigaraki what had altered the timeline? If All Might had found him instead of All for One, and then learned he was Nana Shimura's grandson. Izuku flopped back onto his bed, wincing as he remembered, too late, 
he still had internal injuries to heal. All Might was his stepfather, and Tomura Shigaraki, Tenko Shimura, was his stepbrother. Sure, he'd managed to save Shigaraki in the end, forming a haphazard sort of truce, before the man had died in the final battle with All for One, but they were hardly on friendly terms at any point. Saying this would be awkward was a massive understatement. He was oddly calm about all this. Perhaps he'd got all his panicking done at the hospital. Best not worry about it for now. Better for planning if he was calm. Checking for hidden cameras, just in case, Izuku raised one finger and concentrated. It took much longer than usual and felt like pulling teeth, but a small puff of smoke trailed from the tip. He traced a circle in the air, then let the power go, blowing on it to disperse it just in case there was a smoke alarm in here. Danger sense wasn't exactly something he could check was working, but Shadow Whip happened easily enough. Float only got him a few inches off the bed before it cut out and dropped him painfully back down. Trying to call on it again did nothing. He didn't even think to attempt transmission. With his luck, he'd rip his body apart. This was going to throw his fighting style off entirely. Hopefully the solution to his current predicament wasn't punching people. Getting up, Izuku went over to his desk and opened the laptop. The password was the same as he'd always used, and he had to wonder if the hymn of this time was really that similar. Was it just the thought processes, or were they exactly the same despite their different home lives? Setting up a VPN to hide at least some of his activities, Izuku settled in for some serious information gathering. Sleep was no longer a luxury he could indulge in if he wanted to get home as quickly as possible.